want to welcome everyone here this evening to the Chesapeake Church of Christ. A few announcements before we have our evening worship service. Again, let's keep Brother Robert Smith in our prayers. Uh, pain in his left ankle and his right knee. Sister B. Dunbar, who is uh, in the hospital with pneumonia. Again, Sister Betty and Lynn Ford need our support and our prayers. And uh, the niece of Lee Brooker, Jamaica Hopkins, passed away. Uh, let's keep the Hopkins family and uh, the Brookers in our prayers. They will be traveling for the funeral on Wednesday in South Carolina. Uh, again, uh, Lenny Dale Showalter will be having knee replacement on the 22nd. And Kevin uh, Showalter's brother uh, is now home receiving uh, therapy. Also, uh, keep Sister Tisdale in our prayers. She had a little accident, so let's keep her in our prayers. Uh, and uh, Sister Satishaw will be traveling to Thailand uh, from the 19th of March to the 19th of April. Pray that she has safe tra travels there and back. Again, there will be a baby shower, subtle family, uh, the 13th of April uh, from 2 to 4. Again, there will be a, for the lads to leaders, uh, there will be a sleep in 15th through 16th of March. Uh, there will be a sign up uh, for that program. And there will be a church cleanup day uh, Saturday the 30th of March at 8 o'clock here at the building. Again, the Secret Sister program will be starting. You can check light posts for, for that notification. And if you have any questions about that, see Sister Robert, Robin Smith. And again, uh, the 26th through the 29th of May will be our annual gospel meeting. Uh, Michael Hitt, is, Height, Michael <laughs> Height, uh, Bear Valley Bible Institute will be here. Uh, so let's keep all these uh, individuals in our prayers and these upcoming events as well. And with that, we'll have a moment of silence and be led in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father God, we come before you, Lord, this evening with heads bowed, recognizing, Lord, that we are sinners and none worthy. We're so thankful, though, that your grace and mercy have afforded us this time now, Lord, that we can come together and to have your word brought to our hearing and have this opportunity to be able to come to you and beg your forgiveness, Lord. We're especially thankful, Lord, that you loved us so much that you would send your only son to live a life free of sin here on earth and take our sins upon himself on the cross so that we might have that hope of eternal life with you one day in heaven. Lord, we're so thankful for this congregation that meets here at Chesapeake. We're so thankful for its leadership, for its elders, its deacons, for our minister, and for our members. And we pray that you would be with us, Lord. You would be with us as we go out into the world, that we would be a shining example, a light that others might see you in us. And they, we, they might desire to know why it is that we are the way we are and would desire to come to know you, Lord. We pray that you would be with us as we enter into this worship this evening, Lord. We pray that the things we say and do will be in accordance with your will. That we all may be uplifted by what we do here, but more importantly, Lord, that through our worship you may be glorified. 
Lord, we ask a special prayer also this evening for those who have been mentioned on our sick list and our prayer list. We pray that you would grant them comfort, peace, and, and a measure of healing, Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for everything you provide us daily. And we pr again, Lord, we pray that we would be good examples of you, Lord, that we would live our lives in such a way that not to bring shame upon your church or upon your name. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you so much thanks. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, amen. Number 186, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in morning our song shall rise early. The Bible, snarum, land, and gleaming, 
to cheer the wandering, lone and timid snows. No storm can hide that radiant means of meaning. Since Jesus came to sing and save the lost, give me the mind more holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and long of mining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear, give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold up this lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the light, the holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, all in love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the mind, O Lamb of life and mourn, that slender by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven shining portal. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's wave. Give me the mind of holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. And to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we're now sing number 506. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels and chorus sang as they were come this mud. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good night in the world. Tell me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they lay him. Tell 
how he lives again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. This time in our service is set aside for the Lord's Supper. Is anyone in need of a communion kit? This is the time where we Christians partake in the bread, which represents our Savior's body and the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood for the purpose of remembering Christ until he returns and for also to reflect on all that he has done for us. We can find the authority and frequency of the Lord's Supper in Acts chapter 20, starting at verse seven. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message unto midnight. And we can also find in the word where Paul instructs the Corinthians on the manner of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. And it reads, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on this element, the bread that represents your son's body and all he endured on Calvary for, for, our, for, our, for our sake. And Father, we just thank him for his sacrifice and it is in his name that we pray, amen. Now let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, again, we ask your blessing on this fruit of the vine that represents your son's shed blood. And Father, we just thank you for his obedience and that blood that is the only remission for sin. And Father, we just thank you in his name, amen.
That concludes the Lord's Supper. And also in the word, we're commanded to give. And the authority and frequency concerning the collection of the saints is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting at verse 1. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may purpose that there be no collections, excuse me, storing up as he may purpose, prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And we can also see an example of the manner in how we should give, and that can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let, so let each one give as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. If you'd like to give, there is a collection box in the, in the foyer. You can also mail your checks into the church and you can also give, go on the church's website and give online. Let us pray for our giving. Father, we return to you what is yours. And Father, we just thank you for giving us the ability to be able to work and take care of our families. And Father, we just give this back in love and we just pray that this money will be used in a way that will increase your kingdom on earth and in this body. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're able and willing, please stand with me as we sing number 350, Mansion Over a Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just what God in me love. A little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want gold one that silver. Hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old, and someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk the dream that our pure is gold. No, often tempted, tormented, and tested. My middle of a stone, and though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where. Think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. 
I'm just a pilgrim in such a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more want but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture reading for this evening will be coming from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. That is the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, and I'll be reading from the New King James. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Good evening. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling that lost out. <laughs> Say amen if you can. Uh, good to see you uh, tonight. Uh, and before we get into the lesson, I uh, want to take care of a bit of housekeeping. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Numbers, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter is 31, and I want us to consider verses 25 through 31. Uh, on last Sunday, and this, uh, specifically last Sunday night, uh, we were having some discussion, we were thinking about some principles in terms of our giving. Uh, and the principle of honoring God with the first uh, and the best of all that we produce. Uh, and one of the things that I said is that if you search the entire Bible, uh, you will never find a time uh, where God accepted anything less than 10 percent. Uh, it has been brought to my attention that that uh, there is an exception to that. Uh, Numbers chapter 31 beginning in verse number 25, and in this particular passage, uh, it outlines the directive from God to Moses on how to divide the spoils of war uh, after the Israelites defeated uh, the Midianites. Uh, Numbers 31, verse 25, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You and Eleazar, the priests, and the heads of the father's households of the congregation, Take account of the spoils that were captured, both of people and of livestock, and divide the spoils between the warriors who went to battle and all the congregation. Also, collect a tribute tax for the Lord from the men of war who went to battle, one in five hundred of the persons of the cattle, of the donkeys, and of the sheep. Now, one out of 500, math scholars, what percentage is that? That is 0.2%. Uh, verse 29 says, take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as an offering to the Lord. And from the sons of Israel's half, you shall take one drawn uh, from every 50 of the persons of the cattle, of the donkeys, and of the sheep, from all the animals, and give them to the Levites who perform the duty of the tabernacle, 
of the Lord, one out of 50, uh, that is 2%. 2%. Verse 31 says, Moses and Eleazar the priest did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, um, if we could go back to last Sunday night, um, I would still tell you, as your preacher, uh, as your brother, and as your friend, uh, based on the entirety of the context of Scripture, I would still encourage you to use 10% as a floor and not a ceiling. But that statement that I made, that nowhere in the Bible uh, will you ever find God accepting anything less than 2% from produce or increase, that's not biblically accurate. There is at least here uh, a place where he accepted 0.2%. And 2%. Is that all right? Uh, I want to thank our good brother Kevin uh, for bringing that to my attention. And I want to take this time to appreciate that in Kevin because since I've been here, uh, Kevin has been one whom, uh, if there is something that is said from the pulpit that uh, he may have some different thoughts about, uh, Kevin will say, hey, man, can we meet? And we've met in that office, and we have seen some things the same. Uh, we have seen some things a bit differently. There's been times where I've said, you know, I haven't thought about it that way. I believe there's been times that he said that a time or two as well. Uh, but it's always been very encouraging. It's always been more of an iron sharpening iron. And so I want to commend, uh, I want to commend Kevin for his Studiousness. It makes me think about what we find in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 11 uh, when Paul and Silas were there in Berea. And remember what they said about the Bereans? Uh, these people were uh, more noble minded, more fair minded than those in Thessalonica before they received the word with what? A readiness or an eagerness of mind examining the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. And I'll tell you time and time and time again, and I know Kevin takes this serious, no matter who is standing up here, myself included, you always want to check what they're saying with what the Bible actually says. It is not beyond any man to be sincerely wrong, including Ernest Harrison Benjamin. Is that all right? So, as we were studying this morning and primarily dealing with the concept of uh, not despising the discipline or the instruction of the Lord, uh, we were looking at Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, and we uh, got some New Testament perspective on those Old Testament verses from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. And in the grand scheme of what we were focusing on in that lesson, the form of training, the form of discipline that God affords his children that we were focusing on is the training and the refining and the maturation and the development that comes from having to endure trials, having to endure hard times, having to endure sufferings and persecutions, right? And so we're talking about the need uh, not to despise them, uh, but rather to accept the discipline of the Lord. You look in the book of Proverbs, and as we look at these Proverbs, I want you to keep in mind that particular brand primarily of discipline from enduring hardships and trials. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 1, as we look in Proverbs, we'll see throughout the book of Proverbs that those who are wise, uh, the wise are considered those who will receive instructions, but it is fools. Uh, who will not receive, they will reject discipline or instruction. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 7. The Bible reads, A wise son, or rather, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 13 and the verses 1. The Bible reads, a wise son 
heeds and accepts his father's discipline and our instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to reprimand and does not learn from his errors. Another version reads this way. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Proverbs 15 and verse number five, as we're highlighting the fact that in the book of Proverbs, those who are wise, they receive instruction, they receive discipline while the fool rejects it. Proverbs 15 and verse number five, the Bible says a fool rejects his father's instruction or discipline, but he who uh, regards and keeps in mind a reprimand acquires good sense. Only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. Whoever heeds reproof is prudent. And so we understand the wise, they receive instruction, the fools reject it. Not only that, when we look in the book of Proverbs, the reception of instruction or discipline brings life, wisdom, and the favor of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, verses 10 through 13. It says, Hear, my son, uh, and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. It says, I have instructed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be, in, be impeded or hampered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Actively seek it. Grip it firmly. Take hold of instruction and discipline. Do not let go. Guard her. Why? For she is your life. The reception of instruction brings life, wisdom, and favor of the Lord, while the rejection of instruction and discipline brings death, poverty, and shame. Proverbs 13 and verse number 18. Poverty and shame will come to who? To come to him who does what? Normally I can hear you talking to me. It just sounds like chatter tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline. Uh, Proverbs 13, 18, but he who regards reproof will be honored. Poverty and shame come to him who refuses instruction and discipline, but he who accepts and learns from reproof or censure is honored. Once again, just pointing out some principles from Scripture that the receiving or the reception of instruction uh, leads to wisdom. The rejection, especially of the Lord's uh, discipline or instruction is the behavior of fools, not wise, leads to shame, dishonor, and death. And now as we think about what the proverbial writer is telling us in Proverbs 3, verse number 11, where he says to my son, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. In essence, he's telling us that we ought not to uh, despise it, but we are to accept the Lord's discipline. And this acceptance this acceptance of the Lord's discipline, primarily as we think about accepting and enduring that discipline by way of trial, by way of hardship, by way of suffering, by way of persecution, is deeply connected to surrender and trust. Accepting that discipline uh, is deeply connected to surrender and trust. We think about it because it's for our growth and our maturity. Uh, discipline in this regard uh, is integral to personal growth and maturity. Turn to James chapter 1, verse 2. Because accepting discipline, uh, enduring trials and hardships, it helps in developing character, wisdom, and understanding, which are vital for spiritual 
and moral development. James tells the brethren, he says, to consider or count it all what? Joy. Uh, my brothers and sisters, not if, but when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, it produces, perhaps your Bible says patience or steadfast. My Bible has that word we've been seeing all day, endurance, the ability to stand under, to bear under. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect work. It's perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Once again, we can see this idea of enduring hardships and trials and suffering. They can perfect us. The idea that, yes, they test. Yes, they try our faith. Yes, they test our spiritual metal. But if we will trust the process and not rush the process, if we will trust it and endure it and hold on to God throughout it, it can work out something for us in our favor. It can help us to develop and mature in ways like nothing else can help us to do. It can perfect us so that we may be complete, lacking nothing in our service to the God of heaven. And so surrendering, surrendering to this process means trusting God and allowing him to shape and refine our character for good, for his good and for his purposes. We think about how this surrender and this to this discipline, as I said, I want to just keep us in that context of discipline coming through the hardships and the trials and the difficulties. Uh, it requires accepting uh, this acceptance of discipline requires trust in God's wisdom and trust in God's goodness. It is an acknowledgement that God in his omniscience knows what is best for us, even when it involves trials and challenges. Understanding that we're accepting the discipline of the Lord, understanding the source of this training, understanding the source of the lessons. That the source is not a man. The source is the almighty, self-existent God of heaven. And when we understand what Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, where Isaiah says, and maybe you can quote it, but always keep it in mind. Where Isaiah says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declare Jehovah, the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so when it comes to what you need and I need as a child of God, our father's mind, our father's wisdom, our father's methods, our father's process is infinitely superior than our own human reasoning. And so accepting his wisdom, accepting, excuse me, his discipline is a form of surrender, acknowledging that God's wisdom and ways are superior to your own and my own. This trust is fundamental to a surrendered life where one's, one's own understanding is not the final authority. I want you to say that in your ones. My own understanding. Let me hear you say it. My own understanding is not the final authority. Whose is? Amen. We think about how accepting the Lord's discipline connected to surrender, trust. Uh, discipline often serves. We don't always like this. Uh, it often serves to realign our path with God's will. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse number 67. Psalm 119. And one of the things we'll see as we look in scripture is that when one accepts and learns from discipline, it demonstrates a willingness to be molded and used according to God's purposes. 
Psalm 119, verse 67, the Bible says, the psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, in essence, before I was disciplined, I went astray, but now I keep and honor your word. We find the same sentiment echoed in verse number 71 of Psalm 119. Where the psalmist says, it is good for me that I have been afflict, afflicted, excuse me, that I may learn your statutes. And so the psalmist is acknowledging that discipline through affliction has brought him back to God's ways, aligning his life more closely with God's will. And sometimes that's the case for you and I, that in the good times when all is well, we can drift away from God. We can take certain things for granted. But then the affliction hits. And sometimes when God was an afterthought, now he's the primary thought. When he was perhaps on the peripherals of our lives, now he's right in the thick of it. He's at the core. And if that's the result of it, that discipline is good for us. We needed it. Amen. We needed it. Appreciate Brother Robert. We keep going. We think about accepting this discipline. Uh, it helps to build resilience and dependence on God. Uh, you can be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, you see through this discipline, and I won't say it again because I think you understand the construct of the discipline tonight. I'm going to trust that you're with me, right? Uh, through this discipline, uh, we can learn to rely on God's strength and not our own. And see, this dependence uh, is important. Uh, it's a critical aspect of our trust, understanding that in weaknesses and challenges, one's strength needs to be in who? God. Don't go to sleep on that, Christian. In areas of weakness and in challenges, your confidence, you need to rest in the strength of God, not your own. With your weaknesses. Oh, I think Jeremiah is talking about grace. And this isn't my lesson, but this is a reason many of us drop out because we think we can handle our sin on our own. No. Somebody I know is doing a lesson on blessed are they that are poor in spirit. Do you understand what that means? That that is a posture that I am a spiritual beggar, a beggar in the sense of Lazarus, that I won't eat unless someone gives me their crumb. I am totally dependent on the benevolence and the goodwill and the mercy of another. And for those of us who are going to make heaven our home, that's our posture as we think about our spiritual salvation. That spiritually I am a beggar if it were not for God's grace, if it were not for his mercy, if it were not for what he provided, we would have no, no spiritual nourishment. And that is always to be our posture when we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's as we see it. And when we're not, when I'm on my A game and on my F game, I still need to be a spiritual pauper. I'm poor in spirit. I'm depending on the soul saving work of Jesus Christ. No, I'm not talking to you about tolerating sin. God's going to judge. No, but I'm saying that on your best day, you might hit 95. On my best day, I might hit 75. On someone else's best day, they might hit 25. But all of us are falling short of 100. And the only way we make it is by the blood of Christ. I've got to lean into that. I have to have confidence in that. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me pressing on because I'm trusting in the soul-saving power of King Jesus, not myself. If it's dependent upon us, we might as well stop right now. We're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. That wasn't a lesson, but we'll thank God for that one. Thank God for that one. So learning dependence uh, and resilience, uh, 
understanding that weaknesses and challenges are called for us to rely on God's strength. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul here, he's talking about basically how God humbled him or allowed him to be humbled. He says in verse 7, this is New American Standard. Because of the extraordinary greatness uh, of the revelations, for this reason, Paul says, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Do you know what that thorn is? I don't either. But it's a thorn in the flesh. He says it's a messenger of Satan that it was given to him to torment him, to keep him from exalting, uh, to keep me from exalting myself. He says concerning this thorn, this messenger of Satan, he says concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord. How many times? Three times that it might leave me. Here's this burden. Here's this challenge. Whatever it is, it's buffeting him. It's giving him a hard time. He's pleading with God, take it away, please. One, two, three times. God said, no, boy, you need it. If you let me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power or my power is perfected in weakness. Paul says, therefore, if that's the case, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about not my strengths, but my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, he says in verse number 10, I delight in weaknesses. Do you delight in weaknesses? Insults and distresses and persecutions, and difficulties in behalf of Christ, for when I am weak, guess what? Then I am strong. When I get to the end of my strength, then I start tapping into the greatest strength available to me. That's God's. And you see, sometimes we need those challenges. We need those weaknesses that are beyond us that we know we can't fix by ourselves. Because then we know the only way I'm going to make this, make it through this, I've got to rely all the way on God. And anything that brings you to the end of yourself and increases your trust and your dependence upon God, hey, maybe you needed it. Maybe I needed it for us to regain focus. Put our priorities where they need to be. We're almost done. I can make it. I want us to think about enduring discipline uh, as preparation for leadership and responsibility. For a leader, uh, accepting discipline uh, is crucial. It's crucial. Uh, for developing humility, uh, wisdom, and the character necessary to guide yourself and others effectively. Turn to Luke 18. What I, what, I, what I have in mind as you think about is necessary for this discipline, some hard times, some difficulties, some struggles, some disappointments. For a leader to develop and have the character of humility uh, and wisdom and the character that God would have for him, too, because sometimes as a leader is developing, his character is not what God would have for it to be. His character is not what it needs to be for God to use him for what God intends to use him for. And so he needs some discipline. He needs some training at times uh, because maybe he's proud. And so God has a way of humbling the proud leader. Maybe he thinks he's the wisest in the game. And so God has a way of letting the, the uh, arrogant or the leader who's wise in his own thoughts. He has a way of helping him to understand. Get it out, son. Huh. That although you think you are the master of playing, playing uh, checkers, God says, let me tell you about a game of chess. 
Meaning God, it says, you think you're the wisest? I'm always the wisest in the room. And sometimes he has to bring us down and humble us to say, you know what? I need to do away with worldly and man-made wisdom and make sure I'm lining up with God's wisdom. You look at Luke chapter 18, and when I say leaders, just so that I'm clear, this, this, this is helping me. <laughs> when I say leaders, I do, I am, in this right now, I am thinking about elders. I am thinking about deacons. I am thinking about preachers. I am thinking about fathers and husbands. Uh, I am thinking about uh, men in this congregation who are not elders and deacons or preachers, but they are leaders still and have influence. I'm thinking about leaders. Truthfully, when I talk about uh, leaders, I'm thinking about women too. In there's certain contexts and roles, truthfully, I'm talking about all of us. I hope you can receive that. I understand that that, if, that doesn't make me an elder and, and, and you a woman, if you're a man. Understand what I'm saying, though. We all exercise influence. We all lead in some capacity, in some arena. I'll amen it. <laughs> but in Luke 18, 9 through 14, You just think about sometimes why a leader needs to be humble. Because sometimes we can have the attitude that this Pharisee has. In our leadership and in our approach to the people that we lead. Luke chapter 18, verse number 9, it says, Now he also told this parable to someone who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. I want to take my time, Luke. We might end on this one tonight. Sometimes as a leader, sometimes wife, you can look at your husband this way. Sometimes husband, you can look at your wife this way. Sometimes preacher, you can look at the congregation this way. Sometimes congregation, you can look at your preacher this way. Sometimes I can keep going down the line. That I'm righteous. I'm doing it right. And everybody else is wrong. This dynamic can come into play amongst deacons, amongst, I mean, you can apply it. I'm doing it right. I'm the one doing it. And everyone else is kind of, they're not, they're missing the mark. Verse 10 says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. Look at how he sees himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other preachers. Oh, I'm not like other elders. I'm not like other deacons. I'm not like other brothers, other I'm not like them. <coughs> They're swindlers, crooked, adulterers. I even like this tax collector. Look at me. Look at what I do, God. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. You hear the pride in his voice? His tone, his posture, he's getting it right and everyone else is wrong. Even this posture as he stands or stands before God. But that tax collector, the ne'er-do-well, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to raise his eyes toward heaven, but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. One of my favorite prayers in all the Bible. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, 
This man, the tax collector, this humble one, the one who acknowledged himself as a sinner, the one who lowered himself, he said, the Bible says, this man went to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone, keep this in mind, wife, keep this in mind, husband, keep this in mind, preacher, all of us. For everyone who exalts himself will be what? If I exalt myself, what is God saying I want to do to you? But the one, listen to me, don't sleep on this. Someone sleep, I think you need it. Looking at the ceiling. You want to be great? I have no problem with the aspiration of greatness. I think you should. Just take God's route to it. You want to be great? I love it. You want to be great? If you want to go up, you got to go down in the Lord's house. You got to. Lower oneself. And I've been humbled as a leader in my life. So I'm talking about myself. Don't take, I'm taking it personal. I know what it's like to be prideful and haughty and thinking you have all the answers and you've God's gift to whatever. And God remind you, no, you ain't part of my, no, you're not. And God has a way of humbling you. Um, and it can hurt, but you can learn from it. You can be better if you endure. So we think about this, and here's some application as we tie a button on this one. Here's what I want you to do. As you encounter hardships and difficulties, have in your mind, I'm going to embrace discipline, the hard times and challenges and suffering. I know that's easier said than done. But when it comes, say, I'm going to embrace discipline. I want to hear you say that. Embrace discipline. And so when we encounter difficulties in our lives, instead of resenting them, we can embrace them as opportunities for growth. Recognizing that God's discipline is an expression of his love and care for us, it encourages us to respond to these challenges with humility and a willingness to learn. There is a lesson here for me. There is a blessing here for me. I am determined to find it. Next, self-examination. Uh, times of discipline are opportunities for us to examine self. Uh, they prompt us to reflect on our actions, our attitudes and beliefs, seeking areas where we, where we may have strayed from God's ways. In other words, sometimes uh, the spanking that we're getting, the hardship that we are enduring, we brought it upon ourselves. It is a self-inflicted wound. And we may not realize how we did that, but if we will stop to think, uh, perhaps our actions or our attitudes or our beliefs in some way, shape, form, or fashion were not aligned with God's word and thus the mistake and thus the hardship. I give you an example. <clears throat> And I give it to you. Uh, certainly this time that we have together is about learning God. But I do think it's important for you to learn something about the man of God that gives you the word of God. So you can know something about his heart. I think I told JJ this the other day and maybe even Gene. Uh, the idea that you can have hardship and you can say, I'm just doing the work of the Lord. And realize you, you're missing a major principle in God's word. And that's why you're getting your butt popped. Uh, turn to first Timothy, chapter five, verse one. Many of you may not know this, uh, but I was fired once from a congregation. And. The reason had a lot to do with personality differences. I was a younger man, 
first time ever working with elders. There's a lesson to this, so I hope it's worth the cost of time. But I was younger, and as a younger man, uh, I can be right, but the way I communicated it was very wrong. As a younger man, I was, I, I was very argumentative. Because I did not grow up with a father, I don't know if it's something I never learned or I, if I had a resentment for authority figures. But I had no problem speaking to power. None. And so sometimes, dealing with these older men, even elders, I would be right. But I would be talking to them. Here I am. These men could be my father and my grandfather. And I was talking to them as if they were my sons. <laughs> Bro, I see. Now I can see that. Back then, what? I'm right. <laughs> They're wrong. What? I had all the justifications. Young people, y'all, this might be for you, too. <laughs> what? I'm right. They're wrong. But the way I went about it. And I still remember the first time 1 Timothy 5, verse 1, really hit me upside my head. But Paul told Timothy, he says, do not sharply rebuke an older man. Don't do it. But rather appeal to him as a father and to the younger man as brother, so on and so forth. I can see right there the error in my ways. So see, sometimes the pain, I, that firing hurt. I was pregnant with Caleb. That was a difficult time to go through that. It deflated me a great deal, discouraged me greatly. And whatever wrong those men might have had on their end, certainly I could see the error of my ways. There was a way in which I was thinking, a way in which I was acting and believing that was in direct opposition to what the word of God says. So self-examination, it was a hard one, boy. Whew. <laughs> we'll end with that. We'll end with that. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, we just... Uh, we come to you uh, just thankful for this privilege to be able to approach your throne, and to commune with you. Uh, we pray, Father, that you might help us to appreciate and make the most of this precious opportunity uh, to pour out our souls to you, uh, to petition you, uh, to praise you. Uh, to lay our knees before you. Uh, we come to you, Father, at this time, praying that you be with us as your church. Praying, Father, that you will help us, every one of us, to realize that we are a body uh, and that You expect for us to support one another and encourage one another. That you expect for us to cooperate with one another. That you expect for us to work together in unity and harmony. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to do that uh, as well as we possibly can. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will uh, be with our elders. We pray that you might help them to understand the times and know what we as a congregation ought to do. I pray that you will grant them with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Pray, Father, that you will help them to follow the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, as they shepherd us. 
We pray that you be with them, Father, because we know that they are men, their husbands, their wives. They have ups and downs and challenges. And so we pray that you'll encourage their hearts and strengthen them. And we pray that you will help us to support them in all the ways that we can and should. Uh, we're grateful, Father, for our deacons and those who serve under their oversight. We just continue to pray that you will give them uh, wisdom, that you will be with them and their families, that you will help them to perform their areas of work and task uh, with the leadership and with the dedication and the commitment that you deserve. Uh, we think about our preachers. Uh, we pray, Father, that you help us to be diligent students of your word. We pray that you help us to diligently apply it to our lives. And we pray that you help us to faithfully teach it in a way that glorifies and honors you. Father, we're mindful of every member, every brother, every sister, young and old. We just pray, Father, that you will perfect us. We pray that you'll continue to help us to day by day grow to be more and more like Jesus, to lose our minds and accept the mind of Christ, that there'll be none of self in all of thee. Father, we love you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here tonight, you can put on Christ in baptism. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he died on Calvary's cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day. If you believe that, uh, you're willing to change. You're willing to repent. Uh, Acts 2.38. Willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ. Matthew 10.32 and 33. And willing to be immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. All things are ready. Uh, you can be added to the body of Christ. Uh, we would love to assist you uh, in any way that we can in your uh, pursuit of the cross, in your pursuit of salvation. Uh, for those of us who are in Christ, I really want us, and this is like a family meeting right now, so you got to forgive Brother Benjamin. I really want you to think about in what every area of your service for the Lord, how much of it is driven by insecurity? And just examine to make sure that the motives are right for what you're doing and how you're doing it. That the aim is to please the Lord, not to exalt self or lower somebody else. Just Examine the motives for why you do how you do it. And may we all strive to lift up the Lord, to uphold this, the, the sake of the kingdom, to work together to want to see the kingdom thrive. Because when the kingdom thrives, we all thrive. And when it doesn't, we all suffer. Now say this and I'll stop. But you, and Kevin might check me on this. You search the Bible, but normally when God's people, when God's church had real problems, you know the source of the issue? It was in-house. It didn't come from outside. It was from in within, and that led to God saying, I'm going to let things from without come get you. So I just want to encourage us to band together, to be one in the Lord. That's, we need each other. Uh, we don't have it all together, but together, guess what? In Christ, we do have it all. We do have it all. So if we can pray with you or for you or assist you in any way, please make it known as we stand and sing our song of invitation. Jesus loves me this time. Jesus 
loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let his little child come in, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so, Jesus loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill, from His shining throne on high, comes to watch me where I lie. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so, Jesus loves the children dear, children far away or near. They are safe when in His care Every day and everywhere Yes, Jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me. I will try to live for Thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We pray that on earth all things be done according to your will as they are in heaven. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the stories that you've given us. We're thankful for the lessons we've heard today. May we think, take these things to heart, Heavenly Father, and uh, as we go through this next week, apply them to our lives, and, and further than that also, Heavenly Father. Uh, many of us, uh, as we leave this place and go to various places of employment this week, will face things that uh, are contrary to anything that we've her today, and we may, may we always look back on these things and apply them to our lives, Heavenly Father, so that um, we may serve Thee even in difficult circumstances during our regular work day. Heavenly Father, we pray for this country. We know that many things that, that we've studied here, coming from uh, Proverbs chapter 3, are uh, unrecognizable in this country. We know that many things have changed in, in a very short period of time that makes this, makes this country more unrecognizable to many of us. We pray that we'll be a light that shines out in this world, Heavenly Father, so that many people can come to see what you have to offer uh, the people of this country and the people of this world, so that they may come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be obedient to your will 
and have the opportunity of spending life eternal with thee. Heavenly Father, we love thee so much. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sacrifice he made for our behalf and the example he set for us. The example of one who left uh, the glories of heaven and came to this earth and suffered the things he suffered at the hand of sinful man, so we may have a chance of spending life eternal with thee. We love thee so much, Heavenly Father, and we love your son, Jesus Christ, and we ask you please forgive us of our sins. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.